23, 24. For all our sin and fell short of the glory of God. But they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus. Welcome. I'm glad that you could join us for another edition of our CFC in my basement. This is a very strange time in our world, and I'm excited to share God's Word with you today. Now, before we dive into it, I want to remind you to check out the announcement video we have on this YouTube channel page. There's more information about different ways that we can connect with one another during this coronavirus time and time of self-quarantining. Essentially, the, the way that I want to point out is that we have on Sunday our sermon, and then at 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. we're going to host discussions of that live on Zoom. You can find out more information in that video and in the comments section of this video. And then also on Monday we have our Embrace Grace group. On Tuesday we have a women's discussion online. Wednesdays we're posting our midweek devotional. And then on Thursdays we're starting a couples communication class this week. It's not too late to join any of those. So check out the link below for more information on those things. And then as we get into this, I want to tell you just very honestly that I thought about changing this week's message. I prayed about it. I thought about it. I talked to Whitney about it. And um, frankly, I thought maybe I need to preach on something that's more relevant, that applies more to what people are going through today in this world of chaos and uncertainty around the coronavirus. But then I was reminded that God's timing is so much different than ours and that I have no idea what he's doing. That back the very first week of January when we started our study of Leviticus, we started it, we planned out this schedule, and then the past two weeks we hit all these things about quarantining and the laws around that when the virus broke out here in our world. It was a reminder to me about how God lines things up. So as we look at this, I realized Today's passage about the Day of Atonement is just saturated with the good news of Jesus. And there is nothing more relevant than the gospel message, the good news that Jesus has for our lives. That message is always relevant, always. So I look forward to sharing that with you today. I also want to point out that we're going to be talking about sacrifice today. If you have some young kids, I'm also going to post um, a very short video for our children, and also email out to our church and put a link in the comments for an activity that our kids can do around the uh, idea of the Day of Atonement while not having to deal with the actual sacrifice part if they're too young for that. So as we look at this, I was thinking of a story where there was a woman who requested to come and speak to a king in her village. And she was granted access, and she came to the king, and she said, My lord, my husband died a year ago. And just last week, my two sons were out working in a field. They got angry with one another, and they lost their temper, and they started fighting. And one son grabbed a rock, and in the heat of the moment, hit his brother and killed him. Now, my village is demanding the death penalty for him for being a murderer. But my lord, if you allow this to happen... I'll lose the only family I have. I'll have no one to take care of me. My family name will be wiped off the face of the planet. Please, please have mercy on us. And so the king thought about it. He said, you know, let me uh, get back to you in about a week. This is a difficult decision. She requested again, my lord, please, may I have freedom to speak? And he said, yes, ma'am. She said, please, I don't want a political answer. I don't want something. I, I need an answer today. His life is on the line. And so the king thought for another minute. And said, I will show your son mercy. He will not be put to death for this. I'll send out an edict to tell everyone not to touch him. And he is spared. Again, she said, my Lord, may I please, please just one more thing. May I speak freely? And he granted her access. And she said, why did you do this? Your job is to be just and to ensure that justice is served. Now you've let a murderer, a guilty person go free. You have guilt on your throne for not being just. And this is the dilemma that we see played out through Leviticus chapter 16. We see throughout scripture that God is just, and at the same time, 
He is merciful. And how are those two things balanced? If God is just, he can't just let a guilty person go free. And if he's mercy and shows mercy to us, then he really can't enact that justice on us. Now, I adapted that story from 2 Samuel 14, but the point I want us to see there is this balancing act that God so beautifully displays to us in this chapter. And here in chapter 16, it's kind of the pivot point of the book of Leviticus. So chapters 1 through 15 are about the laws of sacrifice and then in cleanliness. And then chapters 17 through 27 are the expectations for holy living. And I see a parallel to human history as well. As I look at this, it's just like in the Old Testament, we have these laws of sacrifice and ritual purity. And then Christ comes performing the atoning work. And then there's the expectation for a holy living of his people. This would be a good time. I'm going to summarize parts of this chapter. It might be a little bit longer of a message, and so I want to cut it down by summarizing. What I would encourage you to do is go ahead and hit pause on this video. And if you're there by yourself, read or with the family or group that you're with, read chapter 16 of Leviticus, the entire thing. I want you to be familiar with it. So go ahead and read that. Hit pause and then hit play again when you're finished. Did you read it? Good. If not, shame on you. As we look at this, I want to read here some quotes that I think do a great job of summarizing chapter 16. The first is from Dr. Nahum Sarna, and he writes, Admission to the Holy of Holies was barred to all except the high priest, and then he could enter only once a year on the Day of Atonement, to create a perfect and remarkable mix of the most sacred individual, the most sacred of space, the most sacred day of the year, and the most sacred rite. And as we continue, we're asking ourselves the question we've been asking every week in the book of Leviticus. How can sinful people like me and like you worship and live for the holy God? Well, the answer is again here in chapter 16 of Leviticus. There's a summary of this chapter written by Alan Ross, and he writes here, the only way of access into the presence of the Lord is by application of the atoning blood on the mercy seat and the removal of sins of the penitent by placing them on the scapegoat. So here we see the balance of God's mercy and his justice. Let's dive into chapter 16 of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 and 2 reads, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two of Aaron's sons when they approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he may not come whenever he wants into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat on the ark, or else he will die, because I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So we have this new section starting here. God is reminding them of this situation that we talked about a few weeks ago where Aaron's sons were killed for not following the rules. But the key here is Aaron is told, hey, you can't just come into the holiest of holies. That's this section of the tabernacle and later the temple where God's presence is behind this veil, behind this curtain. You can't do this whenever you want. And not just even any priest can come back here. It's only one person, the high priest, and it's only on one day of the year that you are allowed to come. Now, there's a couple of things just here in these first two verses that are really, really interesting and important. So the first thing is that God is talking about this mercy seat. Now, that's the Hebrew word kaporet. And there's sometimes in some English versions some mistranslation of this word. The first mistake is some translations might kind of take a play off the word kapor, which means to smear. But if you notice in the Hebrew letter, there's a little dot there in that middle letter. That means it's doubled. So there's two P sounds. And that means that it is, um, it's not the word to smear. Now, some people, based off of using the wrong thing, will use the word cover or lid because it really is describing the top of the Ark of the Covenant. It kind of is that, but that's not really what this is saying. It's 
The literal translation is the place of propitiation. It's a 10 cent word. Propitiation is a word that means uh, diverting or taking away the anger of God. So it's the place where God's anger is turned away from the people. I think the better functional translation, so it's not a literal translation, but it describes it would be throne. So we have a picture here of God sitting on his throne. The cover of the Ark of the Covenant is his footstool. Uh, an example that would kind of prove what I'm saying here is 1 Chronicles 28.2, where it's written that King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brothers and my people. It is in my heart to build a house as a resting place for the Ark of the Lord's Covenant and as a footstool for our God. So the top of this Ark is a footstool, and God is sitting on his throne in the holiest of holies. And it's a place where this propitiation takes place. We're going to look at that later. This word here for propitiation in Romans chapter 3 later in the message. So remember that. The other thing I want to point out is that it says that I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Now notice it does not say I will appear as a cloud above the mercy seat. It says that I will appear in the the cloud above the mercy seat. That cloud being where we're going to see the incense that uh, Aaron is spreading as he walks into the room. So we have the physical manifestation, appearance of God appearing, sitting on his throne. This word for appear is Hebrew ra'ah, and it is the same word that is used throughout the Hebrew Old Testament to describe any time that God appears in human form. It's the word used in Genesis 12, 7, when the word of the Lord appears to Abraham. Exodus 3, when God appears in the burning bush. Judges 6, when the word of the Lord appears to Gideon. And on and on and on, when God appears. So God in human form, sitting on his throne. So we often miss this. What does that make the holiest of holies? It's God's throne room. Aaron is entering the throne room of the king. To seek the king's wrath being diverted away from people who deserve death. Just like this woman in the story at the beginning of this message. Now, as we go on in this, verses 3 through 10 are going to describe the ritual for entering into the most holy place. The holiest of holies. God's throne room. Now, Aaron is going to use extreme caution when he's entering this. He's lost two sons who took this too lightly earlier in the book of Leviticus. And our English version kind of drops a lot of this. The Hebrew is in the emphatic sense. It's emphasized. So it's not just merely God saying, Hey, Aaron, this is how I would prefer you enter into the throne room. It is, this is the only way to enter the room, Aaron. It's emphatic. And so there are three things that Aaron has to do. This is the only way he may enter the throne room of the Almighty King. And the first thing that he has to do is he's going to have to gather animals. So altogether, he's going to gather five unblemished animals to do this. So there's two rams that are needed. One is for Aaron's own burnt offering and the other for the offering of the people. He needs a young bull for his own sin or decontamination offering. And then he's going to need two goats. One's to be sacrificed for the people's sin, and the other one's to be released. We'll see that here in a minute. The second thing that Aaron needs to do is he's going to have to change his clothes. So he takes off this decked out outfit he has as the high priest. Got lots of jewels and ornaments. Everyone sees that he's the high priest. And he changes into these very plain linen cloths. And I think part of that is humility as he's entering before the king. And also kind of this unanimity that He's entering on behalf of all the people. And then the last thing he has to do is, let's take a bath. He has to wash. He can't bring contamination in there. And then verses 6 through 10 explain. I want to read this with you. Aaron will present the bull for his sin or decontamination offering, and he'll make atonement for himself and his household. He'll be made one again to God. And the next, he will take the two goats and place them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. After Aaron casts lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, 
and the other for Azazel. He's to present the goat chosen by lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin or decontamination offering. But the goat chosen by lot for Azazel is to be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with it by sending it into the wilderness for Azazel. So we see here Aaron is sacrificing a bull for the decontamination offering. He is cleaning away the contamination that sin causes. That's that word sin offering in English. And then he takes these two goats. And one is for the Lord. And the other one is, depending on what translation you read, you may notice some differences. And that's because this is kind of a uh, debated term. And I want to tell you the three options here and why I think one of them is correct. So we have here where in the CSB, for example, it says that Aaron casts lots, one for the Lord and the other for the uninhabitable place. So the word in Hebrew is Azazel. And here's our three options that people uh, kind of fall in line with. So the first one would be that Azazel is a term that means uh, uninhabitable place, like a rocky precipice. In other words, the wilderness, that he's going to send it out to the wilderness. Now, one of the reasons why I think that doesn't work is that later in verse 21, if we translate it that way, it would say that Aaron is to send the goat into the wilderness, the word midbar. So why is Moses using two different words for the wilderness? He's sending the wilderness into the wilderness. The second option would be what most people translate as scapegoat. Now, I like calling this goat that is sent into the wilderness. I think scapegoat is a great nickname to give the actual goat. It is not the right translation of the word Azazel. So the problem that we have here is that, again, it doesn't make any sense. Now, breaking down the Hebrew word, um, you can kind of arrange it, and it, it makes sense that it might mean the one that goes away. So the goat that goes away. But then again, when we read, for example, verse 26, it would read, The man who released the goat to the goat that goes away has to wash his clothes. It doesn't make sense in the text. The best option is that it actually means Azazel is a proper name. Now, some people don't like that because it's a little weirder. Uh, it's a little more supernatural. That would mean that Azazel is some kind of fallen angel or demon in this text. Now, one of the big problems people have with that interpretation is that God bans making sacrifices to other deities and specifically to demons. However, to that, I'd like to point out this goat is never sacrificed. It is sent out into the wilderness to this demon. There's a couple of reasons why I think that is the correct one. So first, there's in Hebrew, they love parallelism. And the very structure of verse 9 has this. It says, one is for the Lord and the other is for Azazel. They're both names. One is for the Lord, one's for Azazel. Verse 21 is resolved because they're not sending the goat into the wilderness redundantly. It's two different words. Midbar means wilderness. Azazel is the name of this demon. Verse 26 is resolved because then it would read, the man who released the goat to Azazel is to wash his clothes. As well, it fits Jewish tradition. When we're reading the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, what Jews throughout the centuries have interpreted things to mean holds a lot of weight to me. So Jews throughout the centuries have interpreted this to be a fallen angel. Now, one of those reasons comes from a book called First Enoch. Now, First Enoch is not included in the Bible. It is not an inspired text. And so I am not saying that it is 100% true. Hear me on that. It's not inspired. It's not 100% true, but it's useful for reading. And what Jews believed in between the uh, Old and New Testament was that Azazel was the name of one of the, the kind of the leader of the fallen angels pre-flood that taught human beings all these different types of things that could be used for sinful activity. So they believed that this was this demonic person, and his name actually became synonymous with the devil. So it's quite possible that this is saying that Azazel is a name for Satan. And then as well, there's this thought in Judaism that the wilderness 
outside of the camp represents the territory of the demonic. That's the chaotic area. That is the area for demons. And a lot of it has to do with the spatial aspect we continue to talk about in the book of Leviticus. I want to show you this picture. This is put together by John H. Walton, scholar that I absolutely love. And in it, he has, you see here, this spatial aspect. In the middle is the holiest of holies. And then it moves out to just the holy place. And then we have moving farther out, the courtyard of the temple. And then the camp where Israel is living. And then out in the wilderness far away. We've been talking about clean and unclean being a scale, sliding scale. The spatial aspect being a sliding scale. So you can see in this how the wilderness is outside the city. That would be the realm representing out where the demons are cast out, away from the presence of God. So with that in mind, I'd like to point out, when Jesus is tempted by the devil, where is he tempted? The wilderness. As well, I think it's very important to remember that when Jesus is crucified, he is taken outside of the city, outside of this city spatial space. We're going to look at that towards the end of the sermon as well, but keep that in mind. So I think... It meets the point of this text. And really the, the point of this is that they're putting their sins onto this scapegoat. And they're casting it, this now unclean scapegoat, casting it out of the city. God's perfect holy presence is here in the middle of the city in the throne room, the holiest of holies. And what do we do with this sin? What do we do with this filth? You know what? That can belong to the evil from whence it came. Cast that out to the devil. That is where sin goes. So we get into this ceremony here. And there's two parts to the actual ceremony that takes place. There's the ritual of blood, which is really concerned with removing pollution from the tabernacle and temple. So they give the decontamination offering. And then there's the ritual of the scapegoat that we were talking about, which deals with the actual wrongs of the people. So in chapter, or sorry, in verses 11 through 14 of chapter 16, Aaron sacrifices the bull that he brought for his decontamination offering. Once he's done that, he enters the throne room of God while burning incense. The incense covers the mercy seat and he sprinkles the mercy seat with blood seven times. I think this is beautiful as we picture the incense raising up. We see the same picture in Revelation chapter 8. As the angels are there, it says in chapter 8 verse 4, the smoke of incense with the prayers of the saints went up the presence of God from the angel's hand. So we see the same picture in heaven. And then in verses 15 through 19 is the actual blood ritual where they're decontaminating the sanctuary. I'm going to go ahead and read this with you. When he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin or decontamination offering and brings its blood inside the curtain, he'll do the same with its blood as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle against the mercy seat in front of it. He will make atonement for the most holy place in this way for all their sins because of the Israelites' impurities and rebellious acts. He'll do the same for the tent of meeting that remains among them because it is surrounded by their impurities. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the most holy place until he leaves after he has made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole assembly of Israel. Then he will go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He is to take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns on the sides of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and set it apart from the Israelites' impurities. So we see the problem here that the sanctuary of God, this tabernacle, is polluted with sin. The impurities have piled up in the tent, and God is not going to dwell in this place. That has been piled up with the impurities from the people's sin throughout the year. Now, I know it might seem strange for us to think that a place could be contaminated with sin, but I really don't think it's that far-fetched of an idea for us. Let's think about what happened on 9-11 and the Twin Towers being knocked down. How do we feel about that site? We have built the One World Trade Center as a monument to recognize what happened and also kind of to turn 
a bad place into a good place of remembrance. So if you think about that, maybe there's a house you grow up in where something bad happens and anytime you drive by that house, you feel a, a nasty kind of way. It's not that crazy of an idea for us to realize that certain places have this kind of contamination from sin. And so on this day of the year, there is this decontamination process for the moral pollution of Israel's rebellion throughout the year, for their wickedness, for all their sins and wrongdoing. All the sins of Israel throughout the year piled up in their cleaning house. Then they move to this scapegoat ritual in verses 20 through 22. Let's read that together. When he has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he is to present the live male goat. Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and rebellious acts of all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry all their iniquities into a desolate land, and the man will release it there. Sin doesn't belong among God's people or at the tabernacle. It belongs out in the wilderness, the wasteland of the demonic. And understand this passage. The, the main point here is that the releasing of the goat indicated that the sins of the Israelites had been removed and would never visit them again. Now, interesting enough, some Jewish tradition said that the people started actually leading this goat off a cliff just to be sure that those sins never headed back towards them. Then, we have the ritual of exiting in verses 23 through 28. And this is basically kind of like the reverse of the entering process. And it happens because we don't want the high priest to contaminate the area that he just decontaminated. Reminds me of if you've ever been in the hospital and you've had some kind of like sterile dressing change or had a pick line. The way that they have to make the entire area sterile because they don't want any infection to spread. We don't want any contaminants to be in place after they've just placed uh, a dressing or they've placed a, a pick line or an IV. So they make sure when they're done, they finish by making sure they continue to not contaminate the area. So Aaron takes off the garments he's wearing and he puts on his normal clothes, resuming his role as the high priest. Before he gets dressed, after he's stripped down, he takes a bath again to cleanse himself. Then he goes out after getting dressed and offers the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people. The guy who led that scapegoat out of the city is to take a bath. And then they take the flesh of these sacrifices. They take them outside of the city camp into the wilderness, burn them out there in that unclean place. And that guy again has to wash his clothes and take a bath. And so in verses 29 through 34, this closes chapter 16, where God says that on the 10th month, the, sorry, the 10th day of the seventh month, this is a permanent statute for Israel. They're going to continue doing this. They're going to, every day on the Day of Atonement, practice self-denial. They won't work. They'll spend time worshiping God and repenting of their sins. So taking this to the New Testament, mm -hmm. I want to look at you with the Day of Atonement. So not just the Day of Atonement, but the Day of Atonement. And that comes in the work of Christ. So we've continued to look at Matthew 5, 17, as we looked at Leviticus, that Christ said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And we see throughout Scripture that Christ fulfilled Leviticus chapter 16, the Day of Atonement. The first one is interesting, and it takes place well before Jesus dying on the cross. What's interesting is, Classical rabbis, a lot of them believed that when the Messiah came, he would come the year of Jubilee during Yom Kippur and that he would uh, read Isaiah 61. There's a quote from the Talmud that says, The world will endure not less than 85 Jubilees, and the last Jubilee, the Messiah, son of David, will come. Well, let's take a look here at Luke chapter 4. Verses 16 through 22, where Christ is in the local synagogue and is called upon to read the Torah. And guess what he reads? Luke chapter 4. He came 
to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came out of his mouth. At the same time, he said, Isn't this Joseph's son? So I love it. Jesus gets up. He reads this text, declaring himself to be the Messiah. My picture is nonchalantly rolls that back up, hands it back, and goes and sits down. Then we see in the actual death and resurrection of Christ, so much fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And a lot of that reminds me of the fact that the Old Testament is like looking at shadows of things to come. Now, if you want to be intellectual about it, we could look at, you know, the old Greek story of the cave and the shadows on the wall. People have no idea what things look like in the real world. But really, it, it made me think of when my kids make shadow puppets. So we see those shadow puppets and we kind of picture how things look. If you only saw a shadow puppet of a bunny and then saw what an actual bunny looked like, you would have such a better understanding of a bunny after you saw the actual rabbit and not just the shadow puppet of it. It's the same way with the Old Testament and what Christ has done. These things were just shadow puppets of what God was preparing human history for. The prophet Zechariah spoke of this. He said, a future day of repentance when God will pour out his spirit in the latter days and they will look on the one who is pierced. Zechariah 12.10 and this fits the description here in chapter 13, 1, Zechariah writes, On that day a fountain will be opened in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sins and their impurities. And then the rabbi Saul, you know him as the apostle Paul, writes in Romans chapter 11, 25 and 27, For brothers, I want you to understand the truth which God formerly concealed but has now revealed so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters in its fullness. And that is in this way that all Israel will be saved. As the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob and will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Yom Kippur is a shadow puppet of what Christ did for us on the cross. I want to outline the shadow that was done with Aaron and the high priest and the full revealing that Christ did. The first thing is from Hebrews 9.24. We have Aaron who enters the physical temple to perform this ceremony. But we have Jesus who enters the heaven, the sanctuary of God in heaven. And it says he cleanses it with his blood. In this way, it's the very presence of God is now the meeting place. It's now the mercy seat for anyone who believes. It's no longer that the throne room is in the holiest of holies. It's that God is there. And then going along with this, Aaron had to one time a year enter behind the veil in order to enter the throne room. Matthew 27, 51 tells us that when Christ died, that veil tore from top to bottom. That means that God is not, his special presence is not just in the holiest of holies. His throne room is not just there. We no longer have to wait for one person to go behind a veil one time a year. We can approach God anywhere at any time. You can approach God anywhere right this second. You can come to him confidently in prayer because Christ tore that. There's no longer that separation needed. It's Christ's death that brings us together. Aaron 
in Hebrews chapter 9, 12, and 14, and then later in 10, he offered the blood of bulls and goats that could never actually take away sin. Beller tells us that Jesus offered his own blood, which truly bought eternal salvation for anyone that's following Christ. Hebrews chapter 7, 27, 28. Aaron has to make sacrifices first for himself. Christ had no need to do that. He was sinless. There was no decontamination that needed to take place. Hebrews 9, 6, 14. Aaron had to do this year after year after year after year after year after year after year. Jesus made the sacrifice once and for all. That reminds me, Titus is on this kick where anytime that one of us does something that's wrong or we say something mean, like maybe I lose my temper, Titus goes, mm, 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 mm. Jesus is going to have to die on the cross again for you. And I had to tell him, buddy, no, no, Jesus died once. That time when he died 2,000 years ago was one time buying eternal salvation for us. So we know he did that one time. He doesn't have to repeat it. Hebrews 10, so that Aaron secured atonement for the people so they could continue their fellowship with God. Jesus didn't just get this temporary fellowship. He bought eternal forgiveness. And we see in this that Aaron placed his hands on the scapegoat and placed the sins of the people on there for that past year's sins. But Jesus took it upon himself to carry away our sin, just like this scapegoat. Hebrews 13, 12 makes a point to say that Jesus did this outside the city, just like this scapegoat was outside the city. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. It's by his wounds you're healed. And then we look at, again, a book that is not included in scripture, but is useful for reading. Paul's disciple Barnabas wrote a letter to the church where he makes this analogy. Barnabas wrote, Take two goats of goodly aspect and similar to each other and offer them. And let the priest take one as a burnt offering for sins. What should we do with the other? Accursed, he says. Accursed is the one. All of you who spit upon it and pierce it and encircle its head with scarlet wool and let it be driven into the wilderness. And when all this has been done, he who bears the goat brings it into the desert and takes the wool from it to place it on the shrub. And he goes on to write that this is a type of Christ. It's a shadow of Christ, what Christ is to do. He is spit on. He is called accursed. And he carries our sins out of the city to the cross. And then I want us to see that Christ is the propitiation of our sin. The word we looked at at the very beginning when we talked about the mercy seat, the place of propitiation, the place of turning God's wrath aside from people. So the death of Jesus made full atonement for his people. That means he makes us at one, at peace with God again. And there's two parts to that. There's the propitiation, turning God's wrath away. And then there's the expiation. That is the actual forgiveness of the sin guilt. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 tells us about this. It says that, he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was pierced because of Paul's rebellion, because of your rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities, crushed because of my iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And you and I, the followers of Christ, are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Paul writes more in Romans chapter 3, 23 through 26. Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They were justified, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as, it says here, an atoning sacrifice in his blood received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness 
Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous, the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, this saving encounter with God is only made possible by God himself who provides this for us. We read there in verse 25 where it said that God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood. You guess what that word is in the Greek of the New Testament? It's halasterion, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew word used in chapter 16 Leviticus for the mercy seat, the place of propitiation. So the Greek version of the Old Testament, it uses this word for the mercy seat. So it's saying God made Christ the mercy seat. He made him the place of a propitiation for us. In Christ's death on the cross, he offered both the propitiation and expiation of our sins, turning away God's wrath and removing the guilt from us. In other words, Paul's saying here, God is visibly present and savingly encounters us, people who have faith in Christ, as Christ is crucified and in the risen Jesus. Imagine this, just like Aaron came and God said, I will be present on my throne and my wrath will be turned away at this place. Paul's saying God is present. God the Father is present. As God the Son dies on the cross to turn away the wrath of the Father, the wrath of God, and to take away the guilt of sin of anyone following him. So Jesus transcends sacrificial system. And we see here that only in Jesus, who's the mercy seat, do heaven and earth meet in this saving encounter. It's only in the crucified and risen Lord that God's glory is present and we have the promise of restoring this fallen humanity and creation for the glory that we're promised one day in Christ. So it's in faith, in Christ, that we approach this mercy seat. Just like God was hidden in the Holy of Holies, in the throne room, in the tabernacle, he is revealed in Christ. Everything, everything, every, 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 everything depends on whether or not you see God visible in the crucified and risen Jesus. It's by Christ's blood that we are eternally made not guilty of our sin and God's wrath is turned away from us through faith in Christ. So what happens now? How do we celebrate this now? So for Jewish people, and I, I want to offer a disclaimer here that what I say might um, not do justice to every group of Judaism. There's lots of different sects of Judaism, just like in Christianity. So I don't mean to misrepresent any belief, but obviously as well as a follower of Christ, as Yeshua HaMasach, Christ the Messiah, I'm going to explain why the modern Jewish interpretation is incorrect, but since the temple was destroyed in the year 70 CE, Jews have had to come up with a way to still follow the law of God without actually being able to offer a sacrifice because there's no temple. And so modern Judaism, for the most part, says that study, prayer, and personal observation of the day are the replacement for the sacrifice that's given. Found here in an article provided by the Union of Reformed Judaism, um, it says that, quote, sacrifice is alive and well. The model of sacrifices, of offering our kindness, generosity, and compassion, even if it's difficult, inspires us to draw close to God. So they're saying it, it takes place of that. Um, now, other groups like Orthodox Judaism believes that all this is kind of a placeholder until the third temple is built, and they're actually working on that. Just last December, they offered a sacrifice 
on a rebuilt altar outside of the city. Looking forward to a day when they're able to do that. And even in the Middle Ages, uh, this Jewish scholar Maimonides said that um, his claim was that God never really intended for sacrifice to be the thing. It was just that, you know, the pagan neighbors did that. So he used a way that people could understand. Um, I think that's completely off base, obviously. But other groups of Jewish thought aligned closer to what God is revealing to us in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And their explanation that's closer to the point is this, that giving charity is a material expression of the inward repentance. And then there is this quote here that says that prayer, repentance, and charity avert the evil decree. And they kind of base this all on 2 Chronicles 7, 14. that says, If my people, upon whom my name is called, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from the evil ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Going along with this thought is kind of, you know, at different times when Israel has been in exile, they weren't able to sacrifice at the temple, and so they had to come up with a different way to do that. Um, and they quote different verses, including Jeremiah 29, 13, that says, You shall call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will hearken to you. You'll seek me, and you'll find me. And so search with me with all of your heart. And so that's that's kind of close to the point that, as we saw, you know, when we look at like David's life, when he repents of his affair, and he says, I'm not even going to offer a sacrifice because what you desire is a contrite heart, a, a sorry, remorseful, and repenting heart. That's kind of close to the point. But the problem is that while a lot of Jewish groups are waiting for the Messiah, they're waiting for the third temple to be built. But what they're missing is that the word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. That Christ even said in John 2 that if you destroy this temple, I'll build it up in three days. And they laughed at him, but his point was that he is the temple. He is the Messiah. And so overall, I, I guess I welcome the idea of an attempt to rebuild the temple and reinstate sacrifice because it will offer great conversation starters for sharing the gospel message of the Jewish Messiah that I follow. But the problem is, is when we try to say that repentance replaces sacrifice when no final sacrifice has been made. So today, if you visit the Jewish synagogue on um, Yom Kippur, you might hear liturgy such as, we have been treasonable, we have been aggressive, and we have been slanderous. Forgive us the breach of positive commands and negative commands, whether or not they involve any act, or whether or not they are known to us. It's a solemn day of repentance, but without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So this lack of a sacrifice cannot simply be replaced by being sorry for our sins and asking for forgiveness and doing good deeds. There's no substitute for blood. However, Christ, as we just saw, was the total fulfillment of the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament was created by God to prepare humanity for his perfect sacrifice. So what do we do now with that? Well, one, if you're not following Christ, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, do it. We're saved by faith in him, as we read. I want to encourage you, if this is something new to you, if you have questions about what it means to follow Christ, or you want to commit your life to Christ, you can email me, and you can call me, you can comment here. I'd love to talk to you about what that means and what that looks like. Then for those of us who are already following Christ, who have already been forgiven of all of our sins, I want to point out that the modern Jewish understanding of prayer, fasting, and observing it, mainly doing good things, um, is so super close, but yet so far away because it's just a shadow of the beauty of God in Christ. Now, the book of Hebrews gives us the proper response to how we should respond 
to the Day of Atonement. And that comes in Hebrews 10, 22-25. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So what can we do in response to Yom Kippur? As Hebrews just said, one, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. We can draw near to God through reading his word and through prayer. A lot of us have a lot more time on our hands and self-quarantine at home. Take advantage of that. Spend more time reading God's word. And spend time praying with assurance and confidence that you can approach Christ because he's paid the final sacrifice. The curtain veil is torn. We can enter into God's presence and pray to him. And then it says to hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Wow, things are kind of unsettling right now. Perhaps with everything that's going on in the world, you feel afraid or scared or, um, I don't know, maybe you feel the whole thing is overblown and, and you feel unnerved by people's reactions. We have hope. We have this confession of hope. Let us hold on to that without wavering. So whether you're feeling afraid, or maybe you're feeling depressed, maybe you're feeling lonely. You know, isolation can do that. Maybe you're feeling frustrated because you have to keep working and you feel like you're out there and you're vulnerable to the coronavirus. Whatever that response is, hold fast to the promise of Christ. Because everything else is secondary. Everything is about seeking Christ. And this is watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Take care of one another during this. One thing we've done as a church is we have kind of grouped by geographic location the members of our church and regular attenders. And then we've contacted people to kind of be a team captain. So Either you're the team captain or you'll be hearing from one where we want to set up a communication of people inside of each geographic location to simply call and check on one another and talk and communicate and break down some of that isolation, provide a chance to open our hearts and voice our concerns, whether it's isolation or work or whatever's going on, and then also take care of one another. Perhaps if I'm running to Kroger, I can pick you up a gallon of milk and leave it on your front porch. So take care of one another and love and do this for your neighbors around you as well. We can do that, spurring on good works for one another and finally encouraging each other. We can call the people in our groups, you are welcome to call anybody and encourage them. We can do this in our Zoom groups. We can do this through the telephone, we can do this through email, through social media, but encourage one another during this time holding fast to the promise of Christ that God is taking care of us. And regardless of what happens, I have hope in Christ, knowing my eternal destination and my eternal security because Christ was the final sacrifice for us. So I want us to think about those things, how we can take care of one another in prayer, holding tight to our confession of hope without wavering and spurring on good works and encouraging one another. I encourage you to participate in our Zoom groups in this discussion as we look at kind of what our attitude should be as we enter God's presence. How is it that God is balancing justice and mercy in our lives and how we can fulfill the call of Hebrews 10 to fulfill the gospel in people's lives today. Pray with me here. Father God, thank you for these shadows in the Old Testament showing your perfect and beautiful balance of justice and mercy that everyone who has faith in Christ is completely free from our sin. We know the justice you'll enact on those who are outside of Christ. Thank you for your mercy and for your love for us. 
I pray that, Father, you would help us this week to hold tight to the promises that you give us, that knowing we have eternal security in you, Lord. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you would encourage our hearts as we navigate these uncharted waters of life. Pray that you would help us to encourage one another, to do good works for one another, and to hold on to the hope that we have. Sharing that hope with anyone outside of Christ, we don't want them to face your justice. We want them to face your mercy. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.